I'm in Roseville, California, checking out one of HPE's labs. Now this is a cool one. I've never been in this one before, and why they let me in here is probably a mistake they might regret. But what we're here to do is to understand what the difference is when it comes to mission critical storage versus their standard arrays. Come check this out. They've got several of these racks set up with XP8 storage. Now, like I said, this is mission critical, zero downtime, can't go down, millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and sometimes lives are at risk when this kind of storage is used. And so criticality of uptime is the utmost of importance. Of course, there's performance too. It does 33 million IOPS. It's got super low latency. It's got all the things you would expect from a premium enterprise storage array. They quote eight nines of availability on the website, but there's something better than eight nines, and that's all the nines that gets you to 100. HPE with the XP storage has been 100% data availability for 10 years in a row. And we're here today to explore all of these things, the architecture, what makes XP8 special, what HPE is doing on top of the hardware to make their customers happy, to keep these systems online, to deliver extreme performance with low latency all the time. So what we have here is a system what we call 4D8C. 4D8C. Yeah, so 4D stands for four disk controller chassis. Okay and 8C for the eight controllers. So you have the big ones here, that's the controller chassis, yes. and in each of them is two controllers. Okay, so this so is So we uh, have each one, one, two, three, four. Ah, okay, great. So that's our four controller chassis with two controllers each. Eight total controllers. Eight controllers. Right. The small ones here are our drive bays. So we have four up here and four down here. Okay. And then you've got a couple other 1U. Yeah, and I have the, the two 1Us down here, and that is the cross-connect switches. So that's all of your controllers talking to all of your drive Correct. bays. Correct. So this connects all the drive bays to all the controller chassis okay. and to the controllers. Okay. And so um, in a maximum build-out, we can do six of the controller chassis with up to 12 controllers. And what we would do is we would have them in a second rack where you would have two of those plus then your drive bays. Okay. And they would be then connected. Okay. They go to the same cross-connect switches though just okay. on the back of the rack. Right. The smallest deployment we would see would be something like this, or if I take it correctly, the one from the bottom, because we had seen the two the controller switches, switches right. the connect switches. So when we look at this uh, controller unit here, so this is our disk controller chassis that I mentioned, and there's two controllers in there. Right. So the upper and the lower controller. Um, each of the controllers has four fan modules, and we're going to open up one of the controllers after so we can yeah. take a look inside. Um, what's going on down here at the end there? Um, on the side here, yeah. what we have is a so-called cache, and uh, we actually have a cache protection. We are writing that on a drive, which is encrypted. Mm -hmm. So in the case of we would have a problem, we're losing power, we have enough battery power to write all the cache, flush it. back out, flush it out, and have it on an encrypted uh, drive here. Yeah, and redundant power, as you mentioned. Yes. And, uh, and we should redundant get... batteries. Everything is fully redundant for every single controller. OK. And then on the storage shelf here, it looks like a 24-drive chassis. Yeah, so that is basically a 24-drive chassis, what we see here uh, with all our drives. Uh, this is SSD drives, what we have in here. The max build-out we have is roughly around a little bit over 2,000 drives. 2,000 drives total in Total in, in, in the two racks right. that we would have with the 12 controllers. And as customers need more storage, they can scale yeah. that, or more controller power, they can scale yeah. those, yeah. and those can be done independently. Yeah, yeah. And so a full max build out, if we go max drive capacity, max number of drives, the 64 petabytes of raw storage. Right. And then actually the interesting thing is um, we have the ability to virtualize external storage behind it. So not only can we do 64 petabytes internal storage, we can actually virtualize a 256 petabytes external storage behind the XP array. For example, if you have something like hot cold storage, you could do something like this. Okay. Uh, if you have an old array that you still paying off, you could say like, you know what, I let it run behind it, and I virtualize everything to my XP array, and that's how I connect to, I migrate data off the old array, but maybe I want to migrate some stuff on the old array, which is cold storage. So now we're going to go pull the controller and see what happens when we start losing the uh, brains of this operation. I.O. should keep operating. Everything should keep running just fine. This is the special tool you need. The tool for what? Wait. The screwdriver. This is the tool? 
So the, the critical tool to this entire project is a very lengthy Phillips head screwdriver. So we've got this four controller set up and as Gus yanks this first one without telling the system that it's going to happen. Now nobody would do this Nobody on would do this on purpose, right. but it could be an issue where we're losing the power on this controller or all our power supplies die or for whatever reason the controller has a failure. Okay, right? which, which, I mean, which it's, we it's, simulated by basically pulling it out. It has a failure, it's gone. But what you haven't had to do is remap anything. You haven't had to exactly. do any manual intervention. We don't know remapping, we right. don't know manual invention. All what we're basically losing is one path out of the four. Right. But what we're also seeing at the same time, the impact on the IOs is basically non-existent. So now on the uh, administration screen here, right. um, on the right side, what you will see is we had before four connections for everything of the uh, four disc chassis. Right. And now we're down by one connection, so we only show three left. What we see on our IOPS, we have obviously a very short blip right. because we lost the connection. So we basically lost a quarter of our bandwidth. But what we see is it's immediately recovering. Okay, so when we think about performance, when, when you're quoting like your 33 million IOPS yes. or something, that's at a big, ch a big configuration that's going right. at maximum performance. Right. So even in a, in a 12 controller system, if I were to yank four of those, we're still fully resilient. Absolutely. Data availability is still 100%, but I've also effectively taken a lot of compute power away correct, from you. Correct, correct. And so you should expect to see at least a little bit of, yeah. of I.O. Loss. So what you typically would see is maybe you get a little bit less I.O.s, right. maybe you get a little bit more latency, but you're not losing any of your traffic. You're right. not losing any of your connectivity. And typically you never run your system at, at the full, full limit. No, right? So nobody insane. will do this, this is yes. insane. <laughs> so when we look at what we're doing here, we're, we're recovering basically up to our 10,000 IOs, what we had before. Right. And we're keeping that consistent running. We have lost a little bit, but we also have to keep in mind, we lost 25% of our power. We talked about, right, when we pull something, we get a warning, obviously, in our administration console. Right. So we got the warning. That one was yellow, but this one's actually red. So that's the controller correct, that we correct. yanked out. And so what happens is, if something like this happens, the system is automatically creating what we call a dump file. Okay. And basically it will notify us what happened at this point and we'll take a full system snapshot and saying like, here's all the error messages I got, here's all the connections that I've lost, writes them in a file and notifies immediately the HPE call home center and said like, we have an issue, one controller down. Well, let's get into that because we want to talk about how HPE layers on the call home data and the intelligence of yeah. all these systems yeah. that, that, that that provides. And this is one instance of it, but I guess too, if you had a, an SSD fail or, or any any other activity yeah. that would that would call home and then through your AI ops tools, you can take that data and then do what with it? For all these customers that allow us to basically have this call home functionality, there's obviously some customers that are dark sites that won't Maybe have they that. can't do it, right? But whenever you can do it, we get from them all this call home data. What we do is we analyze this data. Do we detect a pattern of something in a specific configuration causing an issue? Do we detect a certain behavior of a component that over and over fails at different customers? Right. And when we detect that, what we can do is we can take corrective action and we can go back and say like, okay, proactively let's replace these parts because we know that there's maybe a bad batch of these components. Yeah. Or we detect a certain configuration behavior that causes problems. So we can notify all these customers that have a similar configuration. So like, hey, by the way, there's an issue. If you configure it this way, you might want to change your configuration that way. We don't want to wait until everybody fails. No. <laughs> we detect something and say, like, hey, there's a critical component. And so even now, what we have in this scenario, right? right? And we know that they are coming from the same array that were in a certain production range. We can go back and basically say, like, okay, let's replace these things because they know there's something bad with that. You have to keep in mind, we have these arrays running since 1999. Yeah. So we're talking 25, 25 years, years yeah. that these arrays are running. So it's two and a half decades. And so we obviously have been collecting millions and millions of records, millions of failures. And so whenever we see something that we haven't seen before, we run it against our data collection. Have we seen something similar? Or is there any correlation we can build? And that then gives us new insights. We can go back to our customers and say like, Maybe you want to change this. Maybe you want to do this. One of the things we also would do is if we detect it's a failure part, we will send an engineer out with a with replacement, replacement part. So we're not sitting there with just one controller. 
No, and I'm sure your customers have that guy or the box show up and they don't maybe even know. They sometimes. might not even know in some cases, yes. We have a program that if you move from one generation to the next generation, right. we do what we call a data in place upgrade. Right. So all what we're doing is we're swapping actually controllers. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we basically disable a controller, take it out and put a new controller type in and re-enable it. Let the system rebalance and then go with the next one. But so you so can you actually turn a controller off, so you don't have to yank it. No, you'd, you'd you can be do actually nicer. more graceful. You can be <laughs> like, hey, you know what? I'm going to turn you off, right. take you out of commission. And then put, put a new, put the new in. one in. And um, obviously, there is some things you need to do, like uh, do a firmware upgrade so you get everything on the same level what you need to. But you can do this under full production. OK, so we've failed the third controller now. Yeah. And it's red and, and uh, generally unhappy, but it's still operating. Yes. So what we see is now all the three controllers that we pulled out show up red, and the last one that remaining is still active. Basically, what we have happened is we have reduced our performance of the controllers itself by 75%. We have 25% capacity, right. and we're still up and running. And when we look at our performance data, obviously now we see a slight ditch because we are literally down to one single connection to every single of the disks. We have still extremely high bandwidth to all the data that's on there, and all our applications that are running will still be able to get to the data and continue to run. Well, that's really cool. The uh, resiliency in the hardware is really cool. And uh, that's a big part of what makes that 100% over yep. 10 years a reality. Yes, it is. After a day out here with HPE, the availability of these systems becomes even more clear to me in terms of what mission critical storage is. And we've got to be careful in this industry where these terms get bandied about, where AI is now the hot thing that gets talked about and everyone wants in on these, these uh, key deliverables. But there's a big difference between what a vendor claims a system can do and what the system actually does. Now, we didn't do an exhaustive performance evaluation this time because that's not what this is about. The 100% uptime over 10 years is really what XP storage is providing for HP's customers. And as we've gotten into the hardware, understood that, the software, the monitoring, we took out the controllers while workloads were running, and we accomplished all of that while still delivering what a customer would see is uninterrupted app delivery. And at the end of the day, app delivery is what differentiates this storage from everything else out there. We've got a full report up on the website. We'll link to that in the description below. We'll also give you a couple links to HPE's websites to check out these solutions to learn more about HPE's XP8 mission-critical storage.